Hello, my fellow Ripplers. This is Chris Miles, your cash flow expert and anti financial advisor. Welcome to our show that's for you and about you, those that work so freaking hard for your money and you want your money to start working harder for you right now. They want you want that freedom, cash flow, and prosperity today, not 30 or 40 years from now, but right now, so you can live that life that you love, doing what you love with those that you love. But most importantly, guys, it's not just about being rich, it's about creating a rich life, about creating a ripple effect through the lives of others that through you being financially prosperous, you can be a greater blessing in the lives of those around you. So guys, thank you so much for allowing me to create a ripple effect for you. Appreciate you guys binging and sharing and getting us some past the top 1%, almost the top a half percent now of podcasts out there today. So thank you so much for doing so. As a reminder, you can always check out our website, moneyripples.com, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Money Ripples with Chris Miles Page. So check it out. Chris Miles was able to retire twice by the time he was 39 years old, but he's not content to just enjoy his own financial freedom and peace of mind. Chris wants you to have your own ripple effect so you can live free today. He's not the financial advisor you expected. He's the anti-financial advisor you deserve. He's jumping behind the mic right now, ready to make waves. Here's Chris Miles. All right, guys. So I got a special guest here. I've got Fernando. I've brought back again. Um, you know, I had him on before talking about self-storage. And, and some of you guys, if you haven't binged far enough back, you may not even run across his episode, his previous episode when we talked about what, you know, why self-storage versus other asset classes in the real estate space. Well, we want to kind of do an update of that. Uh, so those of you that don't know Angelo or Fernando, <laughs> I'll call you whatever the heck, I guess. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Angelo, there we go. Fernando Lucci, you know. Uh, so those that don't know Fernando here, uh, Fernando actually, by the age of 30, just turned 30 years old, guys. And he's already done now $75 million of real estate deals in the self storage investing space. Um, you know, he's been awesome there. He's got his own syndication. You guys are welcome to follow him, of course. We'll talk about that towards the end. But man, the guy is just ripping it up out there just doing amazing things and, uh, and buying asset classes. Probably next thing you know, by the time this even airs, he might be over $100 million. Who knows? So anyways, Fernando, it's good to have you back on again, man. Thanks for having me, Chris. Good to be on. You bet, man. So, so you know, for those that didn't maybe hear the last episode, just give them a quick background about what you got you down this, this real estate space and specifically into self-storage. Yeah, so it all started when I was 16. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. From there, I realized uh, I wanted to be a business owner and a real estate investor. Started how most people start by buying single family homes and multifamily properties, continue to trade up. Uh, towards the end of that part of my life, it didn't feel like the passive income was very passive. Mm. Um, I was working 60, 70 hours a week on my rental portfolio. And then as laws started changing and I started to see kind of these bubbles forming in those spaces, decided to exit and go into self-storage for a multitude of reasons. I think we covered a lot of them on the last podcast. If you want to listeners want to go back and, and listen to those, uh, there's nine reasons why I invest in self-storage over multifamily and single family. And then uh, as of recent, we've been growing very quickly to the point where other investors have asked us to participate in our deals. So yeah. we've opened up our, our deal flow to allow passive investors to you know, make a really good return on, on their money while they sleep. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, COVID hit. And that was a very interesting time for us. We didn't really know what was going to happen, but I've always been touting the recession resilience of self-storage and, yeah. uh, you know, using historical data from the last three recessions. And now we have a fourth to, to bring it home now being an owner myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us like the last, you know, now year and a half going on almost two years now, like what, what has been going on? What, uh, I mean, cause, uh, I remember at first, you know, I remember 2019, we're all saying it's going to be a great reset. There's gonna be a recession watch. And then all of a sudden we're like, crap, interest rates went down. People are buying their houses, you know, even though the prices are skyrocketing, right. Um, that's not quite happening. It's kind of a weird economic place that we're in right now. So what started to happen like 2020 now going into 2021. Yeah, so a lot of the pundits have called it a K-shaped recovery. So those mm -hmm. that had assets did very well. Those that did not, unfortunately, were left behind. On the self-storage space specifically, we noticed, um, you know, self-storage 
basically offers customers that are in transition a place to store their possessions. So that may be downsizing, that may be change of jobs, yeah. um, upsizing, right? Buying a larger mm-hmm. home because rates are so low now that they can upgrade and keep their monthly payment roughly the same. And so what we notice in our personal portfolio is that the street rates, they either stayed the same or actually went up because of the increased mm-hmm. demand. Our delinquency rate stayed roughly the same or went down in some of the markets that were a little bit closer to primary markets. Uh-huh. And uh, the collections were, were roughly the same. And again, that, I have to tout my team for that. You know, we wanted to jump in front of it. We made a, a conservative effort to reach out to our tenants and say, hey, is, how you doing? Is there anything we can do to help? Uh, if you need, we can you know, put you on a payment plan, whatever mm-hmm. would work to kind of ease the monthly burden. And that yeah. helped us kind of stay uh, at stabilization. One of the things that was very interesting is occupancy levels at some of our facilities that we considered stabilized started to climb. So that was very interesting that huh. facilities that had a ceiling that we could never really break through ended up um, starting to uptick by about a half a percent um, every week or two. So that was very mm-hmm. interesting. And at the same time, on a macro, macro level, uh, we saw that the self-storage space did very well. So we follow a, uh, a commercial mortgage-backed securities research firm called TREPP, T-R-E-P-P. They do a ton mm-hmm. of research on the CMBS markets or the commercial mortgage-backed securities markets. Yeah. That's where um, these large institutions like Morgan Stanley and Barclays will wrap a bunch of loans and then sell those mm-hmm. loans off to Wall Street. Yeah. So as soon as the pandemic broke and the uh, country for a better, you know, for a lack of terms, went into a lockdown. Mm-hmm. The first three quarters after that, there was 1,700 CMBS loans that were made to the self-storage space. And at the end of that three quarters, only three of those 1,700 loans were delinquent for more than 30 days. So wow. that's a 0.17% delinquency rate. During <laughs> that brilliant. same time, yeah. During that same time, multifamily was defaulting at a rate of 1,800% higher, 18 times the default rate of self-storage. And I think there's a few reasons for that. The first is that self-storage is a lien law-based asset, not a rental landlord-tenant law. Mm -hmm. Uh, So because of that, we didn't have any rental moratoriums Mm -hmm. and all of our rents were still due. And the second thing is because there was an eviction moratorium, self-storage does not operate with evictions. You do not make your payment. We're able to, you know, first we're going to try to get in contact, you work something out, but if, Mm -hmm. if you avoid our calls and all those things happen, then we can actually move it to the auction block. And within 30 to 45 days of late payment, we're able to auction off your possessions, get a new paying tenant into that space and potentially increase rents as well. So those things really helped in our side of the space. Um, And then, you know, we also reached out to local communities. Self-storage is a hyper-localized investment. Typically 60 to 90% of your client base will come from, you know, a three to a five mile radius around your facility. Mm. So because of that hyper-localized focus, we focused a lot on reaching out to the local community. We did a lot of charity drives. We worked with, um, you know, police departments, fire departments, if they knew yeah. anybody in need, charity drives, uh, worked with, you know, little league teams, things of that nature. And that wow. kind of helped keep us in the forefront of, you know, those customers' minds when it came to choosing which bills to pay, as well as it just being a low, lower threshold, right? If you have yeah. a mortgage that could be $3,000 a month, but you have a storage space that's 85 bucks a month, it's mentally a lot easier to make the $85 a month payment than the $3,000 mm-hmm. a month payment. For sure. You know, there's a few good points that you brought up that kind of expanded my mind a little bit more. I mean, you talk about the moratorium, right? I mean, that's something that all of us that have rentals, you know, had some worry about. And I, I didn't get affected by it personally that much, but I know some people did, you know, but, uh, but like you said, in your case, it's a monthly membership, really. I mean, it's a monthly kind of rental space. It's not like the typical moratorium protection. So, you know, you can evict them all you want. You know, there's no real issue there. And, and in fact, people probably try to pay that. Um, so I see that as one big opportunity that if you're already in the real estate space, that could be a great place to diversify into in the self-storage space, especially if you're worried about what the government might decide on, on your own, you know, what you would think would be the things that keep you free. You know, a self-storage would be a great way to diversify. 
the, the second thing I picked up too was just, you know, just thinking about, you know, with everything going on. I mean, I can see where the stable markets, like the more secondary markets, like they saw an increase in prices, right? But it seemed like more of those that are close to the primary markets, the places where this prices are skyrocketing and either they're not working or things like that are going on. People can't even afford to upgrade and, and get a bigger home, right? Regardless of the interest rates, because again, the interest rates drop, but the prices go up. You're still chasing that, you know, like a Dalmatian after a fire truck. So in some ways you're kind of like, well, I got to downsize, you know, and so what's the best way to do it? Either I pay this high price for an extra few hundred square feet of a house, you know, extra 200 square feet might cost you 600, you know, or, you know, it's like $60,000 more or whatever. Right? right. Or you could just say, I'm going to go and just get a, get a stuff, you know, get a storage unit, you know, and be able to get that. And, and that's great. And I know a lot of businesses that have been downsizing have also had to do the same thing, you know, especially if they're moving out of their commercial space. Now they're moving into your space. Right. Exactly. And we, we saw a lot of uh, commercial tenants. Our commercial tenants typically float around 17% of our total portfolio. Wow. We saw it go up to 22%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for us, that's a pretty large that's significant change. Uh, increase. And it was kind of the same thing. Uh, you know, office furniture that wasn't mm. being used anymore. A lot of people were using our facilities as kind of flex space. So mm -hmm. they may have downsized in the office or went 100% virtual and then used our space uh, as their kind of pseudo um, office space. There was also a lot of uh, logistics companies that started using our facilities as kind of midway points. So hmm. they would drop off a lot of their goods at our facilities, you know, rent three, four, five units, and then the semi truck would come pick up those supplies and goods from our facility, as opposed to having to drive into like the city center where their, right. where their uh, manufacturing or warehousing was. Yeah. It became like your own little warehouse, mini warehouse, right? That's, That's right. interesting. That's really fascinating. <laughs> oh, cool. But so what, what do you see as the trend right now? Like what, what's transitioning now that, uh, cause I know right now they're talking about a lot of spending going on and you know, there's a lot of discretionary income, like what's, what's happening on your space, your side of things. Yeah, so I talked about some of the pros in the self-storage space. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to talk about some of the cons, right? So not only yeah. do we buy existing facilities, but we also do ground up builds and conversions of existing, um, you know, buildings. So yeah. one of the things that we notice is that the cost of construction materials went through the roof, especially steel, which is a major mm. component of self-storage. Yeah. And we saw steel prices increase three, four hundred percent. And so that was pretty mm. tough on us. So one of the ways that we got around that was by being kind of innovative and thinking outside the box, um, mm -hmm. pun intended. So what mm -hmm. we ended up doing was we found a lot of these big box retail stores that yeah. had done pretty bad during the recession. Mm -hmm. uh, they shut down their doors, but they had, you know, this prime real estate. Usually it was on Main and Main, surrounded by dense residential with, you know, discretionary income mm -hmm. um, in the type of demographic, you know, demand drivers that we want. And prior to the pandemic, uh, although it was already a dying industry, um, mm -hmm. a lot of the owners of those buildings were kind of holding out for really high prices. And after the pandemic or during the pandemic, we started to see a little bit of breaking to that price adherence. So all of a sudden properties mm -hmm. that, you know, prior to the pandemic were priced at 50, a hundred, $150 a foot. Yeah. We were able to start picking up for 10, $15 a foot. So one tenth the cost. Wow. Um, perfect example. I, I, I bought a 110,000 square, square foot Sears building in Ohio mm -hmm. for $9 a foot. And now what that allows me to do is the envelope is already ready. Mm -hmm. It's already up. So it, it does two things. One, it allows me to insulate the, the project from the weather, especially in the Midwest where I'm from. Mm -hmm. So during the winter, you can't pour concrete at you know certain temperatures and then in the south in the summer it's too hot to pour concrete for a couple months out of the year so yeah. that mitigates that piece and allows us to to shut you know kind of close the construction window the yeah. second piece is in general it takes our ground up builds from 12 months to about six or seven months so that helps a lot with the construction loan financing and then the other piece is just the total total cost of construction. You know, my mm -hmm. total project costs on a ground up development, is going to be anywhere between a hundred to $120 a foot mm -hmm. with these conversion projects. I can bring that down to 60 to $70 a foot. So I save a ton of money and still have an asset that is priced the same as one of these class a recreate facilities that I'd build from the ground. So some pros and cons, I guess that came out of that, but, um, 
that was a, an interesting pivot that we had to do as soon as we started seeing materials pricing, you know, I mean, triple or quadruple almost overnight. Yeah. Well, I can see why now you had this opportunity to buy more, right? Because, uh, right. you know, the, with, it might seem like a door closed, but as a result, more doors open for other innovation and creativity when you're in your space, which, which kind of shows your intelligence, right? Of what you guys are doing right there. And, and I hope this also, you could play this on a bigger macro scale for everybody listening is because a lot of people say, oh no, this is happening with real estate. Oh, I knew it. It's going to be bad now. And, and then somebody will ask me, they're like, well, how can real estate always be a good buy? You know, how can there always be opportunities in real estate? Well, this is why, you know, there's, you know, even if the door closes, there's usually there's other doors that open up, creating new opportunity, new innovation or creativity to be able to make money in this space that none of us have to look outside of real estate, even though it's not a bad idea to look and diversify in different places. There's so many opportunities within real estate and so many different types of real estate. We don't even have to look back at the stupid stock market, you know, that's a big gamble anyways, and then makes you buy whatever they want you to buy, not what you want to actually invest in. Yeah. And you brought up a couple of really good points. Um, the first is the fact that when you say, hey, maybe real estate is oversaturated or it's not doing as well. Yeah. What we realize with self-storage is that it's a hyper-localized business. So you, it's mm -hmm. almost impossible to say a self-storage space is saturated or not, or even uh -huh. you know Chicago is saturated or not. We have yeah. to look at these three to five mile pockets and say, is this three to five mile pocket oversupplied or not? Mm -hmm. Someone that's renting an apartment is willing to go across, all the way across town to save you know, 50, 100 bucks. But someone that's renting a storage facility, they typically want it to be within five to 10 or 15 minute drive from their home. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty inelastic when it comes to pricing. So they're not going to travel an extra 20 minutes just to save five bucks a month on a, on a unit. Yeah. The second piece right. is you talked about the stock market. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the second pieces that was kind of a double-edged sword in the self-storage industry was as the recession started, you know, continuing to go on with the pandemic, mm -hmm. the lenders and the other investors that were a little bit more, um, asset class uh, agnostic started mm -hmm. to shift monies away from the office space, the multifamily space into the self-storage space. And that caused cap rates to plummet. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, when you started talking to brokers, you started seeing cap rates in the four, four and a half percent range, which at that amount, I'd rather just throw my money into the stock market and not have to have to do any work for it. So mm -hmm. it, it brought us to to focus on two things. The first is if you can't buy them at the cap rates you want, then you need to build them. Mm -hmm. And second of all is if the, um, if the, uh, the cap rate itself is that bad when you're looking on market, then potentially you need to start focusing on your efforts on off market acquisitions. And so for us, we have sourced probably 90 to 95% of our deals from off market sources oh, wow. because I always, I always give the analogy of when you're going to an auction house, right? You have two auction houses across the street from each other. One of mm -hmm. them has a hundred people in it and the other one has one. Which one do you think is going to be able to get goods at a lower price? The one that has less competition. So that's yeah. how I view off-market acquisitions. If there's less competition at the table, then I am typically able to set the terms and price that is going to work for me as opposed to battling against market forces, these big hedge funds and private equity funds that have zero cost of capital and are willing to buy things at just above inflation, just to be a safe store for their cash. I love it, man. That's great stuff. Well, cool. I appreciate your time today, man. This is really interesting yeah. thing. And again, just kind of relates the fire of, you know, why self-storage is kind of a cool space to be in too. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if people want to follow you or get to, you know, get to know what your kind of deals you're doing and, and just see what you're doing, get to more know you more, what would be the best way for them to follow you? Yeah. So I was, you know, the traditional routes are, you know, go to impactselfstorage.com or titanwealthgroup.com. You can follow us on social media, but what I found is the more barriers you put in front of people to get a hold of you, the, the less likely they are to actually go through the effort. So what I've been doing recently, which some people think is crazy, is just offering up my cell phone on these podcasts. So if you want to reach out to me, this is my real number. You can text or call. It's area code 630-408-8098. Six three zero four zero eight eight zero nine zero. Feel free to drop me a line. I'm, I typically respond within a couple couple hours, so that should be no problem. Awesome.
Well, yeah, we'll be sure to put in, you know, the cell number as well as you know, it's kind of crazy, but uh, I guarantee most people <laughs> won't call the cell number anyways. That's the thing. It's like, if you're calling it, it's because you're, it's, it's you're dead serious because everybody's thinking, oh, he's going to be too busy. No, I don't want to bug him. And he's like, and that's right. exactly why he gives you the cell number. Right. So uh, you're only bugging him because you really want to. Um, but yeah, we'll be sure to put the other web addresses for, you know, impact as well for Titan Wealth and, and those sort of things too. So yeah. again, Fernando, thank you so much for, for uh, joining us today and offer so much value. And the rest of you that are here, you know, remember, it's great to hear this, this kind of stuff and always listen to these podcasts, but it's another thing to do something about it and create a change in your life. So don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer as well. Go and make it a wonderful and prosperous week. We'll see you later. Visit us online at moneyripples.com for more resources to help you fix money leaks and get your money working harder for you now.